The world is not driven by greed. It's driven by envy. That's Warren Buffett's right-hand man and famous billionaire Charlie Munger. Men do not desire to be rich, but to be richer than other men. That's John Stuart Mill, the great Victorian philosopher and politician. I can't stop comparing myself. It came to a point where I want to kill myself because I don't want to look like this. And no matter what I try, I'm still ugly or feel ugly. I constantly cry about this. It probably started when I was 10. I'm now 13. Back when I was 10, I found a girl on TikTok and basically became obsessed with her. She was literally perfect and I remember being unimaginably envious of her. Throughout my preteen years, I became obsessed with other pretty girls. That's a girl on Reddit describing her experience of social media, as quoted by the social scientist Jonathan Haidt. So when trying to understand why people behave as they do, some of the darkest, most powerful and perhaps underappreciated factors are envy and anxiety. People do what they do because they don't want to be second best or they don't want to be outside the pack or they don't want to be the odd one out. And this can lead to grasping, to acquisitiveness, to selfishness, to obsession. Our passage in Philippians offers a remedy to this problem, but its remedy doesn't come out of a particular practice in the sense that Paul wants us to force ourselves into a pattern of action. Rather, it picks up on one of the ideas from earlier in the letter, if you remember from chapter 2, verse 5, having the mind of Christ. So here, Paul's remedy starts in the internal world, in a state of mind and a state of heart. And that change then spills out to what we do. So Paul is is sophisticated here in that he doesn't just issue commands. He calls for a change in perspective, almost for a change in personality, and then implies that that will almost inevitably lead to a change of behavior. So let's look down at the passage together and see how this works. There are three parts that I want to go through in order. The first part, verses 1 to 3, Paul asks the people of the church to be united, free from argument. Then verses 4 to 7, Paul then explains how he says this can be done, that is by seeking the peace of God. And then finally, verses 8 and 9, Paul makes his solution more practical by telling us how we should train our hearts and minds and therefore our actions. Back to the first section then. Therefore, my brothers and sisters. Now, this is a closing passage. This is the end of the letter that we're coming towards. So it makes perfect sense for Paul to want to wish everyone well and to then give them a bit of a pointer in the right direction. And the verse is quite emotional. Because he describes his brothers and sisters as his joy and his crown. So for his pointer in the right direction, he tells them to stand firm and to be united with each other. Indeed, he pleads with them to be united. So he's passionate about this. It's something that he considers really important. So he saved it for the end, not because it's an afterthought, but because it's a culmination of everything that he's been teaching the Philippians so far. He then names three individuals specifically, Euodia, Syntyche, and Clement, and he asks them to be united with each other. Now, interestingly, these names have meanings. Euodia, she is a fragrant offering or a sacrifice. In this, it's the same word as is used in the epistle to the Ephesians. Syntyche, her name means something like 
happenstance or accident or lucky strike. And then Clement. His name means merciful or mild or gentle. So when you see the meaning of these names, it's almost as though the unity being suggested is a unity through sacrifice, through accident, through pleasantness, i.e. through good times, bad times, and the ups and downs of life. There's also another quite strange and striking feature of the text. And if you look down at verse 3, you'll see it. After talking to Euodia and Syntyche, Paul then says, Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. So he suddenly addresses in the singular, you, my true companion. No one seems to know who this true companion is or why Paul is suddenly addressing himself to somebody in the singular without actually specifying who that person is. At the beginning of the letter, it's quite clear that the letter as a whole is addressed to the Philippians as a, as a body, all of them. So the sudden shift to writing to one person is quite jarring. Now, it's possible that that's deliberate, that it's a device designed to arrest the reader, as if Paul is reaching out from the page to speak to you and to speak to you, the reader today, and telling you to be united to your brothers and sisters in the Lord. So, if you're angry with someone else in the church family, go to them and make up, and don't delay. If you know that you owe somebody else here, sitting in the pews, uh, gratitude or the answer to a question or maybe an apology go and give it to them straight after the service don't let the discord spread or fester of course we are united in the Lord anyway through our shared faith and through the headship and the work of Christ so in what way could we be truly divided if our names are written in the book of life with Euodia, with Syntyche, with Clement, then isn't it true that we are far more united and have far more in common than anything that could divide us? Now, it may be that you're with me so far, that you agree with that, you agree with all the things we've said about unity, but you find it hard to achieve. Well, I agree with you if you feel that way. It sounds right, doesn't it? But it's not clear how you'd go about actually doing it. Because, of course, there could be genuine disagreement within the church family, or it could be the case that people just really don't get along. So it's nice and high-minded to insist that we should be united with each other. But how? How do we do that? Well, in his second section, Paul gives his solution. He starts off by saying, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. So it looks at first as though the antidote to strife and argumentation is rejoicing. But again, this seems a little blunt at first because if there's genuine disagreement, if there's genuine conflict, how realistic is it simply to command people to rejoice? Well, fortunately, this isn't all that Paul says. It's not how Paul goes about his explanation. In his next three verses, he unfolds how this works. He says, Let your gentleness be evident to all. Other translations have reasonableness or moderation. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then the result, Paul says, is that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So that's yet another series of commands. But critically, tucked right in the middle, is not a command, but a claim. The Lord is near. And you see that at the end of verse 5. 
And that expression of closeness, perhaps hitting the same emotional note as the beginning of the passage, where Paul describes his brothers and sisters as his joy and his crown. So the passage doesn't hang on Paul's commands, but but on some kind of relational significance. But the significance of the claim that the Lord is near goes further than that. The nearness of the Lord is critical because it's what spills out into the surrounding verses. It's what gives them their life. Let me explain. If the Lord is near, then that is an antidote to anxiety. And that's the verse after. If I really, truly believe that my maker, my keeper, and my redeemer is close at hand, then why would I be anxious? As the psalmist begins in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. He protects me from danger. Whom shall I fear? So if I really, truly internalize that he is present, then all the energy that I might spend Uh, ruminating on what worries me, turning it over in my mind, that can be channeled into addressing the Lord who is right there beside me. If the Lord is near, then that is also a spur to reasonableness and gentleness. And that's the verse before, verse 5. If the Lord, who is the great judge, will right all wrongs, then... I don't need to be some bringer of justice. I don't need to rush in to crush opposition. That simply isn't my job, and it just isn't needed if God is there to guarantee justice as he is. I can be gentle, be reasonable, be moderate, but confident that in the end, he will secure the future. As Paul says in Romans, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So while we should fight for what is right, we don't do so out of fear or desperation. We do so with strength and resolve, but with equanimity and with peace in our hearts. And then let's work out one layer again in the passage. If the Lord is near and we can let go of anxiety, we can feel that stillness and that calm descend, then surely that does give joy and peace. Not the kind of ecstatic delight that you might think of when you hear the word joy, but certainly a sense that it's well with our souls. And when life is purged of those feelings of impending dread or the burning need to fix something or be somewhere or please someone and is filled with the knowledge that the Lord will make all things new and has indeed gone ahead to prepare a place for you. Does that not make the world feel a little different? That then starts to explain Paul's formula for how we're supposed to achieve unity. A person who is characterized by joy and peace, who is concerned to do right but not troubled to the core, or mortally wounded or grossly offended by opposition, that person is not a person of strife or discord. That is a person who can find common ground with their brothers and sisters. Now, please be clear from verse 2 that this is unity in the Lord. This is among people who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. So what we're not talking about here is passivity in the face of wickedness. Say, uh, greed, love of money. Nor are we talking about simply giving up when it's obvious that our brothers and sisters are behaving badly, for example, by being cruel or ungenerous towards each other. How to act in those situations, uh, that poses different questions, and Paul addresses them in his writings elsewhere separately. What we're talking about here is unity within the church through the gospel, both because the gospel literally unites us, we we all participate in Christ's saving work, 
but also because it has this effect on character that Paul is describing that makes it easier for us to relate to each other in gentleness, in reasonableness, in peace. Finally, the third section. Now Paul gets practical here with this passage about how we are, how we are filling our minds. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, this is an interesting passage for me because I was once rebuked on the basis of it. And that's because uh, I'm quite a big fan of horror movies. And I once mentioned this to a fellow Christian who pointed me to this passage and asked me if that was a particularly good way of spending my time. Now, I'd like to make it clear that I remember this person very fondly and all is well between us. But it was an interesting moment because I think it highlights a trap in how we as Christians can approach the questions of discipline and holiness. It can be very tempting when striving towards holiness to set oneself rigid rules and to be prescriptive. And don't we all love a system? It could be a diet or a meditation routine or some kind of rule about the amount of time I spent in front of a screen. And these aren't necessarily bad things. I'm all in favor of discipline. But Paul in this passage is not prescriptive. He leaves it to his listeners and readers to consider what is praiseworthy and excellent. And if I could briefly enter a a plea in defense of horror films, um, I'll let Scott Derrickson do the talking. He's the director of uh, such classics as Sinister, one of the Hellraiser films, and The Black Phone. He says this, To me, the horror genre is the genre of non-denial. It's about admitting that there is evil in the world and recognizing that there is evil within us, and that we're not in control, and that the things that we are afraid of must be confronted in order for us to relinquish that fear. That's very good, I think, and and, and, and a Pauline analysis. There's something wonderful and noble and excellent, even in the kind of film that sets out explicitly to deal with darkness and fear. But of course... Paul is saying that we need to keep an eye on what's going into our minds. So it's it's not a free-for-all. And given that Paul gives us this command, I think we should consider some possibilities about how to put it into practice, both on the negative side and on the positive side. On the negative side... We live in a particularly risky world when it comes to external influences about what's going on in our minds, what's filling our minds. Smart devices and social media mean that the flow of content towards us is like a river in space. It's like a flood. And the results are striking. Even among people who are, by historical standards, living with the wealth of kings and with technology and medicine that can essentially perform miracles, our young people become more and more anxious, reporting that they think of their lives as meaningless or worse. And hence the tragic passage from Reddit that I read out to you earlier. So there's lots to say about technology and media, lots good and lots, and lots bad, but just specifically in the context of this passage, what happens on our devices is risky for two reasons. First, when you're scrolling on Facebook or TikTok or Instagram, you are not in control of what's going into your head. Instead, as we all know, the algorithm is feeding you what it knows you want to see or what will get the biggest dopamine hit. Why do we allow this? Why do we outsource to somebody else 
or not even somebody else, but to a machine to dictate what will fill our minds. Does that really respect Paul's command to have a care for what we are filling our minds with? Should we be taking more responsibility for choosing what we do and don't see, hear, read, watch, listen to? Second, at least part of the way that these devices get inside our heads is through envy. And as I said at the beginning, envy is one of the dark horses of human motivations. But for envy to drive you, you have to be filling your mind with what other people have bought, where other people have gone on holiday, how other people look. And that's precisely what is served up to us on the internet every moment of every day. Envy has always been an issue. The Tenth Commandment is there for a reason. But the internet has turbocharged it in a way that I suspect Moses could never have imagined. Now on the positive side, how can, we, how can we live Paul's encouragement to fill our minds with everything that is true and noble and good and beautiful? Well, first, as should already be clear, I hope, Paul's open-minded about where you can find these things, where you can find things that are true and noble and praiseworthy. He simply asks us to be deliberate about it. Think about what you are reading, watching, talking about with your friends. Why this and not that? Don't let the answer be just because it was there. And by the way, the answer doesn't have to be some highfalutin theological reason for watching this program and not that program. Focus and purpose is often enough. Just just fall in love with something. Look for the best and the most excellent examples of it, and you'll begin to see the divine in it. Be delighted by the riches of God's world. Find the noblest and the truest lyrics or cartoons or the finest sportsmanship or cooking techniques and you'll glimpse a little bit of what Paul is talking about. Second, recall from verse 6 that Paul's model of prayer is filled with thanksgiving. When you pray... Do you specifically pray prayers of gratitude? My experience is that the easiest prayers are the prayers of supplication, asking for things, and then a little bit harder are the prayers of confession, saying sorry for things. And then the hardest are the prayers of thanksgiving, because I'm forced to remember the good in every situation, even when I'm having a bad day. But when we commit to prayers of thanksgiving and fill our minds with the blessings that we have seen. Our internal world is changed, and our thoughts and our feelings and our aims and our desires start to shift towards the spirit of joy and peace that Paul is describing here. Third, don't skimp on reflecting on what is most true, most noble, most right, most pure, most lovely, most admirable, most excellent and praiseworthy, which is the life of Christ. Was his self-sacrifice for our part, though he was innocent, not the most noble? Was his teaching that has changed the world and still rings out 2,000 years later not the most right? Is his gentleness and kindness, even to children and to the sick and to the marginalized, not the most lovely? Is his divine nature that can calm the winds and the waves and can raise the dead, not the most admirable and the most excellent and praiseworthy? Call him then to mind. Call his works and his teachings to mind. Call his self-sacrifice and his glorious resurrection to mind. And let those thoughts be a fertile ground for the germination of new ideas and new feelings about what life is for or even more modestly, what tomorrow might be for. And finally, once we have filled our minds with these things, let's do as Paul says at the end of the passage and put Paul's teachings into practice. In a way, this follows naturally, because as Paul has demonstrated in the passage, 
Once the internal world is transformed, the action will follow. Jesus says in Matthew 15 that sin begins in the heart. So if our hearts and minds are transformed, then surely our deeds will be transformed too. Paul wants that for us. The Christian walk is not a private affair. The work in the heart and the mind is vital. But once that transformation is happening, that should shine through and touch all aspects of what we do and say. So let's pray that for ourselves now. Heavenly Father, we ask that by your Spirit, you would teach us how to fill our minds with what is true and excellent. Please cause us to find that all over, but supremely in the perfect life, death, and life again of your Son, Jesus. And please, as you transform our minds, transform our actions too, so that we would be people not of envy or of anxiety or of discord, but of joy, peace, and gentleness. Amen.